from the Digital Media Center on the campus of Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon. This is Ramping Up Your English, an educational program for intermediate level English language learners. Here's your host for Ramping Up Your English, John Letts. Welcome to Ramping Up Your English, winner of the 2020 Southern Oregon Television Award for Best Education Program. Ramping Up Your English is an instructional support program for intermediate level English learners. If you've already passed the beginning stages of learning English and you want to reach higher levels of English proficiency, this program is designed to meet your needs and get you closer to your goal. Ramping Up Your English is for English learners from all language backgrounds and for people of all ages. We take a content-based approach to helping you reach higher levels of English proficiency. Our current thematic unit is Native Americans. This is segment one of episode 94. Since we produced our last episode, people of Southern Oregon, Northern California, and the world lost a great source of spirit and strength when the beloved Tekelma elder, Grandma Aggie, passed away at age 95. Agnes Baker Pilgrim was the oldest living Tekelma elder and a founding member of the International Council of 13 Indigenous Grandmothers. She promoted the discovery of many of her people's ways and cultures. Well, among her many achievements was the restoration of the sacred salmon ceremony, first on the Applegate River and then at Tillamish on the Rogue River, where Tekelma elders and storytellers have conducted that welcome ceremony for the salmon people since time immemorial. 150 years had passed since the last one. Now I've always planned to feature her life and work in this series of videos on Native Americans. Let's watch this short video to see something of her life and wisdom. Site at Tillamook, the ancient village site on the Rogue River. They lived here 22,000 years, and their biggest staple was from the river of the fish. And they would do they wouldn't do a salmon ceremony till one man of the tribe would sit on the story chair in the middle of the Rogue River, upriver from Gold Hill, Oregon, that they, he would sit up there in the story chair and watch the eddy below the rock. It, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't catch a salmon until they saw one come in that eddy below the story chair. And when they did, they would all gather and and catch salmon, and they do a salmon cookout on the river with them all coming together so peacefully and to share that food. So when I was living in Crescent City, California, I was, God called me to come back here in 1993 to restore the sacred salmon ceremony. Grandma Aggie brought the salmon ceremony back um, in 1990s. We first brought it back to the Applegate River because the land at Tillamook, the traditional land, wasn't available at the time. And the ceremony was done out there for many, many years. And then when this land became available in 2007, uh, we, we got together and planned out bringing the ceremony back to its original place at Tillamook. And that happened in 2007 and the ceremony was done for a number of years. We haven't done a ceremony in the last couple of years. Um, Aggie is uh, now 95. Um, not sure how much longer she can do the salmon ceremony or whether it's time to pass this along to a new keeper of the salmon ceremony. But we're also looking at trying to put together a ceremony that really addresses the original intentions of the old time ceremony. They did this ceremony before they even, any of them went fishing, all the tribes come together right here, thousands of them. Every, every tribe here in Southern Oregon.
My name is Tish McFadden, and I came to Oregon in 1980 as a cultural resource specialist for the Forest Service. My job then was to survey lands along the Rogue River corridor, looking for prehistoric sites of Agnes Baker Pilgrim's ancestors who lived along the Rogue River for over 15,000 years. They had a sustainability that we are hoping to retain in our modern life now, where they could stay along this river all this time in balance with nature and with each other. And I'm here today with Tuawi, Agnes Baker Pilgrim, elder of the Tekelma people from Southwest Oregon. It was magic. You hear the sound of the falls. She was singing in Tekelma and there are drums. That was the first time since 1850 when all these people were marched out of here that the elder of the Tekelma made it to that spot. So I came today to sit in the same place where my father sat and letting people to know that we are carrying on the culture and the traditions of our people here. Morning Star is the source of wisdom in this book. It's a journey to wisdom story, salmon taking a trip from the Great Salt Sea of the Pacific Ocean all the way up to Boundary Springs. And he, he is inspired by you, by Morning Star. He's swimming toward his teacher. And all of Salmon's friends are inspired by Salmon. Mm -hmm. So they're making this travel together and they're helping each <coughs> other through several challenges and rainstorms mm -hmm. and earthquakes and winter and snow and they arrive mm. at Boundary Springs and they meet you there. My husband at the time was a fisherman on the Klamath River, Grant Pilgrim, and he caught all our fish caught, and he made all our cooking sticks out of redwood because redwood, when it's heated, doesn't have any pitch laced in, in the wood. And he'd make all our cooking sticks. He'd catch our fish. And then we came over to, on the Rogue River above Gold Hill and started this uh, salmon ceremony. We started uh, in 93. 1994, the state fishing game came and they said, Grandma, we don't know what you've done, but there's more salmon in that river than we ever heard of. <laughs> I said, when you do this blessing, God helps and to bring the salmon back. Tell me how that came about. She was working in Crescent City with children and their families, and she was sitting out on her deck one day, and again, she'd been hearing this, that grandma, or maybe, maybe spirit, creator, didn't call her grandma, but this message, you need to be, you will be a voice for the voiceless. And she would wonder, what's that? What does that mean? And she was sitting out on her deck and had a glass of water there. And she looked at it finally and she thought, hmm, that water can't speak for itself. And then she looked down at her dog sitting by her and said, hmm, my dog can't speak for himself. And then she was aware of the wind on her face and she thought, oh, the wind, the air, the air can't speak for itself. So she got this idea of what Creator was talking to, about, that she understood then much more fully what being a voice for the voiceless really would entail, speaking for the air, the waters, the animals that had no voice. Well, I'd like to see the hands of all the grandparents that are here. Bless you. You are the wisdom keepers from your families. Bless you all. The rest of you are in training. <laughs> so lighten up. You know, getting old isn't for wimps, is it? <laughs> Us grandparents know that. It's a bumpy road. Never did I think when I retired way back there that I'd, I'd get to this point in my life. I'm on roller skates, whether you see them or not. <laughs> I'm going all the time to get home once in a while is a treat. And being this international grandma is not an easy job. I put in 10, 14, 17 hours a day. Try that when you're nearly 86 years old. <laughs> you 
Many countries that I go to, the elders can't believe I still drive a car. <laughs> well, I used to be a race driver when I was young. <laughs> and so all of those teachings from my pit crew <laughs> still work today. I used to be a log truck driver, set my own chokers, and I used to be a boxer. Nobody messed with me, <laughs> or my sisters. My brothers taught us how to box because they said, we can't take care of you girls all the time, so you gotta learn to defend yourself. So, but that's, a, that's another life, a different life. And I am in the spiritual world now, and I fought that for many years. Because there's six chiefs in my background. One of them was the first elected chief of Siletz, of the Confederated Tribe, Chief George Harney, my grandfather. And uh, my mother was an Indian princess, although they didn't say that to her because it wasn't a word for that in her language. But I didn't want to do this spiritual path because I wasn't worthy enough. I wasn't good enough. Leave me alone, give it to somebody else. At one time, my friend who is a psychologist in Eureka, California, said, just, just think you better quit doing that and do it. <laughs> and I said, oh, I guess so. <laughs> and so the minute I said that, I felt like a big load went off of my back. And so it has been quite a journey, quite a story. Be grateful to wake up in the morning and say, ah, one more day. Learn to be grateful for just one day at a time. Before, when I was a voice for the voices touring the world, all by myself, being this voice for the animal kingdom, because they don't have a voice, and for the air, and for the water, and for the earth, I was a voice for the voiceless. One time I was in the night, woke up and told me that water could hear to talk for it. Years went by until last year I met Dr. Immersa Omoto from Japan, the famous scientist who has done a wonderful thing for the world that has proven that water can hear. He wanted to know how I knew. I said, spirit told me. I had been talking about it for a long time because I knew we were all water babies and water would call me as it called my people hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago that without water, we would all die. Thank you so much for what you do and the life you give. Bless you, bless you, bless you. To honor her at her passing, I produced a tribute to Agnes Baker Pilgrim as two episodes of Adventures in Education. A link to those episodes will appear on my website, letscreate.org. You'll find it on the episode 94 page of Ramping Up Your English. You'll also find a link to the books she wrote and published. We will all miss Grandma Aggie. We can honor her by living some of her profound wisdom. You're watching Ramping Up Your English. This is segment two of episode 94 part of our social studies unit on Native Americans. In our last episode, viewers got to watch part one of the seventh in a series of videos about Native Americans produced by Let's Create Productions for Ramping Up Your English. Today, we feature the second part of that video. The name of this video is 1491, the year before the voyage of Columbus, the last year of pre-Columbian America. Let's watch part two now. Far to the east of the Mississippi River, in the current state of Georgia, earthen mounds bear witness to the extent in space and time of the Mississippian culture. The remains of the city at Akmolji testify to highly organized culture in the southeast. Today, Akmolji is a national monument. The mounds contain evidence of affluence and artistic mastery. The visitor center reproduces what a visitor may have seen centuries ago. 
Today's visitors are welcome to enter the Earth Lodge, where they can see the place of the sacred fire. Akmogi occupies a region near the people who became known as the Muskogee and later as the Creek. Some arrived in this region from other parts of the continent, bringing with them the bones of their ancestors for burial in their new home. Further north, we find the Cherokee, people believed to have moved from the northeast woodlands, speaking Iroquoian language. The hunter-gatherer way of life incorporated farming once they settled in their new home, much like the Navajo in the west. Corn production was well established in the region, and the Cherokee fully embraced it. Growing corn was a sacred act performed by worthy women. To this day, the Cherokee performed the green corn ceremony, a ritual of the greatest importance. The children of the corn mother and the hunter were the hero twins. Thus, the value of balance was instilled in the Cherokee from the earliest memory. Animals sacrificed themselves to feed and clothe the Cherokee, but only so long as they showed respect and maintained balance. Failure to do so could result in sickness or injury. Healing could be found in plants, but only if their gathering and preparation were done in the right way. The Cherokee approach was not only to maintain balance, but to walk in beauty. One important ritual to the Cherokee was going to the water. A river or smaller stream was considered a living being giving its blessing to all who immerse themselves in it in the morning. In 1491, the Cherokee were not a centralized government, rather a collection of four bands made up of seven clans each. The band was governed by notable elders, collectively known as the White Chief. Only in times of war did the Red Chief gain control with younger members, including the beloved woman. Power returned to the white chief when war ended. Harmony and consensus were always sought. If consensus could not be reached with the majority, the dissatisfied members left the community and formed their own in a different place. Once a year, each community would perform a ritual of forgiveness and renewal all crimes except murder were capable of being forgiven. But those crimes had to be confessed to the sacred fire from which the heart could not be hidden. Fire was also considered a living being. All important ceremonies were held around the sacred fire. Led by the beloved man, Cherokee people danced and sang around the fire. Some songs were only to be sung in the fire's presence. The sacred fire remains the symbol of the Cherokee. Further north, southeast of Lake Ontario, five tribes had a history of constantly fighting each other. In this region lived the Mohawk, the Onondaga, the Onega, the Cayuga, and the Seneca. All of them with small territories and all hostile to each other. De Kanawida sought guidance for a better way, and he was given a vision which he shared with all who would listen. He became known as the Great Peacemaker. His message was spread by Hiawatha, and the process of coming together was facilitated by a woman who became known as the Mother of Nations, and thus was born the Iroquois League. This changed everything. Raids on each other stopped. Conflicts were now settled by the Council of Fifty, where consensus was sought among the five tribes. The five rivals now joined hands as sister nations, forming a bond so strong that a falling tree could not break it. 
Systems were put in place to assure individual liberty and justice. Onondagas were appointed to be the keepers of the council fire. As the first among equals, the Onondagas called the others to council each year to discuss their differences and to keep peace among them. With war among themselves greatly diminished, the Iroquois League enjoyed greater success when fighting their Algonquian-speaking rivals. They became a major power in this region by 1491. They became known as the people of the Longhouse, the traditional structure housing extended families in a matrilineal society. Some longhouses covered an area longer than a football field. Each of the five nations had territories laid out in great rectangles, much like the form of a longhouse, each of them with access to the Hudson River on one end and Lake Ontario on the other. Choosing peace with each other instead of war, the Iroquois League prospered and set an example for others. Other groups of Native Americans lived in the Great Lakes region, the Huron, the Erie, the Kickapoo, and the Winnebago, the Fox and the Chippewa, all learned to thrive in their environment. All had complex relationships with their neighbors. Native Americans in the Northeast might look out over the great waters and wonder what good things would it bring to them. They would also have known that the sea brings great storms. Having survived so many over so many generations, they would have known the ways of survival. They may have looked to the sky for signs of trouble and challenge. Those signs would have told them nothing of the storm to come. Across those great waters, events they had no way of seeing would affect them in ways that none could imagine. Far beyond their view in 1491, Christian armies on the Iberian Peninsula surrounded the walls of Granada and an ambitious navigator from Genoa was planning a journey. You're watching Ramping Up Your English. This is segment three of episode 94. Our current thematic unit is Native Americans. I'm John Letts. The credits you just saw are from the entire seventh part of our video series on Native Americans, produced for Ramping Up Your English. In part two, our main focus was the Iroquois and the, that the Iroquois League and on the Cherokee. Well, the Cherokee are best known in history as the native people who developed a written alphabet and as the victims of the Trail of Tears. Now, this book is entitled Trail of Tears, Paths of Beauty. The National Geographic book features two Indian nations, the Navajo and the Cherokee. It's mostly from this work that I found information about the Cherokee ways of seeing the world and their role in it, what social scientists call their world view. You can probably check this book out from the library. They should have it or they should get it. I'll have the ISBN posted on my website 
letscreate.org. Now, the other focus of the video was on the five nations that formed the Iroquois League. My resources for that information included Wikipedia and the book, The Native Americans, An Illustrated History by Turner Books. Both sources relate the events and actions that led to the Iroquois League. The Native Americans, An Illustrated History by Turner Publications is a rich source of information I'll continue to consult as we study the history and culture of Native Americans. I'll have the ISBN on this book on my website as well. I love to hear from viewers. You can contact me at letscreatepro at gmail.com. Visit my website, letscreate.org, for all the episodes of Ramping Up Your English. From the home page, click the Native American unit, then choose episode 94. All the support materials for this episode are found there. You can watch and even download this and all episodes of Ramping Up Your English at archive.org. Enter the Ramping Up Your English in the search box and you'll find all my episodes there. Ramping Up Your English can be seen on RVTV on Channel 15 on the Ashland Home Network and on Channel 182 in the rest of Southern Oregon on Charter Cable. You can stream Ramping Up Your English for free from rvtv.sou.edu. I want to thank my director, Denise Ross, and my talented and dedicated crew, and I want to thank you, our viewers, all of you help make this program a two-time award winner. Join me next time for Ramping Up Your English. I'm John Letts. You've been watching Ramping Up Your English, a support program for intermediate level English language learners. Learn more. Visit our website at letscreate.org. You can also watch or download today's program at archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. Join us next time on RBTV Voices for Ramping Up Your English.